Well, this week I thought I would work on the brakes of my car. Why not save some money and do your own brakes? <laughs> I've done brakes before, so I have an idea of what's involved. But just to be sure, I watched a YouTube. God bless YouTube. I watched a certified mechanic change brakes for 45 minutes. And I watched it carefully. And this was days ahead of time. And then when it was time to do the brakes, I watched it again. Now the third time. I'd done them before. I watched the video. And now I was watching again just as I was about to do the work. I was sure I had what I needed. I went outside. I got the wheel off. I looked at the rotor. And I looked at the caliper and all of the nuts. And immediately realized I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I said to Brandon, go get my phone. And you see, as long as I had the phone at my side, I could refer to it constantly. And so the work commenced. It's a little bit like how we are with God. God fills us. God strengthens us. God walks with us. We have all this confidence. And then we think we could do just about anything. And so what do we do? We promptly leave God behind and figure with all this knowledge and experience we have, we're going to be fine. And we fall straight into a ditch in the dark. It's only when we make sure we have God with us constantly that we're able to walk right. We see this especially in today's readings, beginning with this passage about King David. This may be one of the best written passages uh, of, of, of human beings in all human history. It is that good. Every single word is perfect. There's not a better way to explain the sin of David. It starts out by saying that it was the springtime of the year, the time when kings go out to battle. So David stayed home. Now, did you know from the first sentence it was about to go bad? <laughs> the ark would go with Israel into battle, and David has always gone forward into battle, leading the armies. It's the reason Israel became so strong. But here, the ark goes out, the armies go out, and David figures he's going to be just fine all by himself. And immediately you can see that he's gone into a place of, 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 um, of following his own path instead of the path that was right for him. And you know he's going to fall right off the cliff into the ditch. It says that it was the middle of the afternoon when he woke up. Another bad sign. He gets up off his couch and decides, hmm, I wonder if I went up to the top of my house, if I looked around the city, if I might be able to see something, someone, spy on someone who might be exciting to me. And he looks down and he sees a woman bathing. And he says to his servants, go get her for me. The word in Hebrew is the same as you would say, Hey, can you go get me some potatoes from Kroger? It's the word to buy things, to acquire things. He sends his servants to go acquire Bathsheba. Now, some people say she must have, uh, she must have been uh, enticing him, or the sin is hers because it's a sin of adultery. This plainly flies in the face of everything the scripture says. There's a massive dis disconnect of power here. The king has just called for her. He calls her into his bedroom. She's married. Her husband is out in war. Is there any way that this cannot be uh, seen as a sexual assault? She's not asking for it. She's not seeking it. She doesn't even get to say a word. And David forces himself upon her. This is where I actually even want to sort of bring out that parenthetical it seems awkward that the scripture would mention she was purifying herself after her period. But actually what the Hebrew says is now she was purifying herself after her uncleanness. And our interpreters, our translators have translated that into after her period. But if you've ever known anyone who experienced sexual assault, what's the first thing they do? They go home and they take a shower, then they take another shower, then they take another shower, then they take another shower, trying to cleanse themselves of their uncleanness.
That's what's happening here, and our uh, interpreters, translators of the scripture are not helping the matter at all by turning it into something she might have been doing anyhow. It happens right after the assault, and it says, now, now she was purifying herself after her uncleanness. One thing leads to another, and David it finally is, um, is, is condemned by the scripture, and this is his lowest point and his greatest sin. And it all happens. He, see, he, he, he lies to Uriah. He brings them back from the battle, which means what? He's leaving all of his fellow soldiers without one of their best, uh, without one of their, their, their best veterans. So he's committing now a sin against the rest of the army because they're weaker. He brings Uriah. He lies to Uriah. And then he sends Uriah out to the front lines carrying his own orders to be murdered. He gives the message to Uriah to carry to the general that says, put him in the front lines and let him die. The whole thing, this massive cascade of sin happens. Why? Because David didn't do what he was supposed to do. He's supposed to stay with the Lord and do the things that are called upon for a king if he had followed the followed what was right. If he had followed God, if he had kept God with him, none of these things would. The child, by the way, that Bathsheba has um, doesn't even make it to its first birthday. The child also dies. And from this moment on, David's household is always in turmoil. We see another image of this with the disciples. And it's after the feeding of the 5,000. And you can see, so the disciples were there. They witnessed this incredible miracle. Jesus is there. Jesus feeds all of them. They pick up the scraps. There's 12 baskets of scraps, one for each of them. So they've all been fed by Jesus. They're strong. They feel like everything is great. And what do they do? They promptly go out on their own and leave Jesus behind. We don't need Jesus. Let's go to Capernaum ourselves. We've got everything that we need. We just witnessed a miracle. What can go wrong for us? Well, when you leave Jesus behind, chances are things are not going to go well for you. They go out into the water and immediately there's a massive storm. They're stuck on the chaos of the waves. They're, they're rowing and they're rowing in the darkness. It's also a metaphor and they are completely afraid. This, both of these are perfect images for us to hold and to contemplate and even to sort of reflect on as images of our own, of our own failings, of our own sin. When have you had that moment when you should have been somewhere but you didn't go, when you didn't bring God with you, when you were, you, your mind wasn't on, on God, your heart wasn't set on Christ, you went out under your own power and maybe with a little bit of a spirit of defiance and promptly fell on your face. That's where they are today. Paul's telling us what we need. Paul is telling us what we need in Ephesians. Paul's praying for you and for me. And what is this prayer? It's all inner. He prays that you would be, would be filled in, in your inner being with power by the Spirit. Think about that. That you would be filled in your inner being with power by God's Holy Spirit. That Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith. And that you, just feel it now, that you would be rooted and grounded in love. This is where we're supposed to be. Filled with power in our inner being with the spirit of Christ dwelling in our hearts through faith. And our roots going deeply into being rooted and grounded in love. This is where we are at our best. The, the, the word of grace is that it's never too late. Next week, we're going to hear the second half of David's story. And we're going to see that David comes back. If David had been rooted and grounded in love, if David's heart had been filled with the presence of Christ, if David's inner spirit had been strong, he wouldn't have gone off the path. But when he does reclaim that, what happens? He's able to apologize to God. He's able to ask for God's forgiveness. And after a terrible time of turmoil in his family, Bathsheba especially gets her, um, gets her consolation because her second child is named Solomon. And Bathsheba 
now gets to raise this child, not the eldest in David's house by far, but gets to raise him with all the wisdom of a woman whose husband has been murdered, all the wisdom of a woman who knows the ways of the world, all the wisdom of a woman who knows how a king should be and what it looks like when a king goes wrong, and she's able to raise him in every moment of his, of his growing up in a way that he could be wise and strong and deep, and Solomon becomes known as the wisest king and ruler and human being that has ever lived. Maybe that could make a mother's heart proud. What do you think? At least she gets the chance to have someone there with her constantly who she can care for and raise and teach to do well. The disciples too, if they had had Jesus with them, none of that would have happened. But it's not too late. They could call Jesus into the boat and notice what happens. As soon as they like wanted him in the boat, immediately they get where they were going, right? The storm literally ends instantly. And the journey instantly also ends. And the chaos and the seas are suddenly gone, literally within the span of a sentence. They wanted Jesus in their boat and immediately they got where they were going and Jesus is with them again, strengthening them with power in their inner spirit. Christ dwelling in their hearts right through faith and being rooted and grounded in love and they get the opportunity to hear the words of Christ which he's going to say over those next four weeks where he reveals some of the deepest mysteries of what it means to live in faith. If Christ, if God had been with you or if better yet if you had stayed with Christ you wouldn't be in the jam that you're in now. Yeah. And if you're thinking about a pickle from the past, well, that wouldn't have happened either. The word of grace is it's not too late. It's never too late. It's never too late to come back to God. It's never too late to ask Jesus back into the boat. It's never too late to hear the prayer, to be filled with the Spirit, and have Christ in your heart, and be rooted and grounded in the God of love. It's never too late to get back on the path again. And find that although there are speed bumps and ditches, God never ditches us. But promises always to be with us if we'll just listen and invite and stay.